Good evening, everyone. The Rancher is back to go into yet another rambling diatribe of the news of the day. Now, I'm actually kind of doing a follow-up rant um, after a very good panel that was done by Vin of Vin and Sorry Middle America. They put it on put it on YouTube. I was actually part of the the live chat involved in that, and um, it was moderate. He did the moderation, and it was with a pro gun sort of a pro-gun anti-registration side and the pro-gun control side and uh, an additional voice of someone who is not actually an American but is looking at us for the, for the view of the outside looking in which is valuable of an opinion because it has to be understood that guns is a unique thing for the United States from its very inception from our second amendment but not only that but we also romanticize and canonize the gun into our own American mythology I mean our media going through the centuries I mean talking about the books like Last of the Mohicans where you know Nathaniel Nathaniel Hawkeye was uh, called by the Huron chief Long Rifle. That was his term for him because of his exceptionally long, big flintlock musket he had. The panel discussion, this debate, was thoughtful, civil, and brought insight on either side, which is pretty much refreshing compared to what we normally deal with when it comes to is an emotionally charged issue like this you know none of us is you know innocent of that obviously including myself but um, and there are both sides of them come up with solid points but then there's some things that just flat out I just do not agree with and I, I am one-sided on this I'm not middle fenced when it, when it comes to issues like you know, having to deal with a mass shooting and all you can do is just wait for the next mass shooting and then just look at the same people in the face and go, is this enough? And to get the same answer back as I got the last dozen of answers back, the last dozens of answers back from there and so on and so on. One of the points that was in agreement was that to making background checks harder, uh, be be more thorough about it. And here's the here's the unfortunate thing. I mean, since the video that I did, which was about the mass shooting at the elementary school, Rob Elementary in Texas, and the the, the wonderful detail that we learned from the cops. Since then, there had been at least six other incidents of gun sh of gunfire and death from a university in Louisiana, a Tulsa clinic, a hospital, a cemetery, a guy shoots his gun kills a little boy, about 11 years old, shot him through the neck. You know what the circumstances was? This guy, it was in the Carolinas, this guy was just shooting his gun in traffic. That's it. Now, it's hard to describe, or maybe not describe, it's hard to square the circle as where do we put these events of gun violence as opposed to you know what people in major cities see nearly every day I mean you know anyone that brings up gun control or gun registrations or any of this and someone will go oh what about Chicago or what about New York what about high crime areas that makes me want to ask the question, is mass shootings 
like shootings in a school or shooting in a public event or shooting at a cemetery shooting at a hospital is that the same as shots fired between criminals versus cops gangs versus gangs shootings in relations to other crimes as if the main motivator was robbery or some other motivator and gunfire is the resulting of it do we get kind of lazy and lump it all in together or do we take this as case by case basis or do we put a crowbar separation between that kind of gun violence and this kind of gun violence It again makes us wonder, you know, go through our heads as to what the answers are to any of this. Or what could we be brought up as answers towards this? I heard something recently that was promoted by Middle America by then that I later saw Lindsey Graham kind of endorse, which, you know, as soon as that happened, I got eh, a little hazy, but. I still kind of like the idea of in order to have to, to, to try to have some form of security in these schools try to hire military veterans I mean you know on paper that sounds interesting that sounds kind of good for me that checks off the box of that you don't have teachers having to arm themselves or be trained to arm themselves or be trained to use their weapons to shoot most often than not children students which goes against the whole point of them being teachers of their trying to not only educate the students but to build a rapport with the students so there'll be a level of trust and security. So what if you're that loner kid that people worry about and, you're, and that teacher is a teacher that's armed and trained to look out for certain things to protect the other students? And that loner student goes into their bag and the teacher goes and reaches. Now teacher didn't fire and the loner child just pulled a book out but regardless of her or him firing the gun or not the damage is done at least for that child and for that teacher for that matter because teachers are compassionate people and it would be heartbreaking to see that type of fear is someone that you're trying to educate. I'm probably making a point I made last time around, but it's actually a pretty good point, so I like it. So I'm doing, doing it again. So that checks off that box of not having a teacher that doesn't, if it doesn't want, if he or she doesn't want to, to be trained and armed and any of that. So you just have military vets do this you know, protect the school and so forth. And, you know, it also checks off the other boxes, you know, sometimes people, when they come back from military duty and they come back to the world, as they say, and maybe, they, maybe they have things lined up for themselves, maybe they're going to enjoy a nice restful retirement with their friends and family, or maybe you, maybe you don't. Maybe it is something to the point of where you want to have something to get up in the morning for. And, I mean, maybe it's idea idealistic, but this is an honorable duty to protect children, All right? Now, you know, I've seen this argued uh, on the panel, actually. And there's also some good points uh, to the contrary of that, meaning that there's certain vets who unfortunately go through things like post-traumatic stress disorder if they were really in, like, 
a heavy military hot zone, and that could be a factor for them. A response for that, at least from my point of view, is that then you, you kind of handle it as a case-by-case -case basis. I don't think there should be any blanket, any generic, oh, this is a generic one-shot quick fix for anything. I'm more in favor of doing a case-by-case -case basis, and especially something along the lines of having having people set up to be guards and security for school children. Then uh, just assuming everything is going to be okay, it's on paper, it looks good on paper, so therefore it should be fine. No, but that's an option. Now, I was thinking about this as I was, I was coming home from work. You know, there are solutions that no one wants in this country. There are, soup, there are solutions if you were pushed to that edge where you just look at a paper and an article just has a list of all the school names that had tragedies happen at the hands of somebody wielding a gun on children and teachers and staff and so forth. If we were any other country, how how long would it take? In that long line of names of schools, how long would you think it would take in any other country for them to really clamp down on guns? Something that we cannot even imagine ourselves doing because, again, gun culture in the United States is a separate and unique culture of the United States. It cannot be understood anywhere else but here. I mean, you, when I was, when I was on that live chat, bantering back and forth with various other people on the live chat, and some people were just throwing out, you know, their opinions in all caps, and some of this is a God-given right. This is a God-given right. See, this is a completely United States way of thinking. This is a God-given right. What God are you referring to? Because let's break down that. Let's break down that sentence, that phrasing, that the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, the right to buy guns of various kinds and calibers is a God-given right. A shaft of light came down through the clouds and Gregorian chants were singing over God handing down this right. And obviously this happened, what, back at the Constitutional Convention, right? That this is when God came down and inspire James Madison and Thomas Jefferson on crafting this God-given right to bear arms for the well-regulated militia. Point of order. If this was indeed God that proclaimed this God-given right, then he must have been missing something that week because he brought down the God-given right of the right to bear arms at the Constitutional Convention. But slavery completely slipped his mind. Is that what we're going to go with? That guns are more important than people in bondage. Is that what we're going with? <laughs> no. The Second Amendment. None of the amendments were God-given rights. That, that, that was human make. Humans were there with their little parchment and quills and they were writing things down. Could it be somewhat inspired? By, by whatever the religious practices of the people who are actually writing this thing? Maybe. I don't know where you get the inspiration that, especially if this is Christian thinking, that Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, Son of God, who wanted you to love your neighbors like your brother, 
would inspire you to pick up a weapon that they to value to venerate to canonize guns to collect as many as you can and be damn what caliber a bullet that it possesses it is holy scripture I don't know which Jesus that is. That sounds eerily similar to the Jesus who somehow Pope Urban heard in his head when he decided to unleash the first crusades or the Jesus that was whispering in Torquemada's ear to, while he conducted the Spanish Inquisition. But there should be t-shirts that says, that's not my Jesus. And no, it's not. It's not. Second Amendment, much like all the other amendments, is not venerated God-given. It's given by man. What is God-given? Is that everyone should have life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. That's not even, that's not even God-given. But the concept of it that we should be born free to pursue our own ventures, to exist in our own lives, um, even if you believe that, for 80 or 90 years since the inception of the United States, that wasn't all that believed. Even after the Civil War, where emancipation of the slaves was a economic and military tactic to break the South. You know, that's eight out of the ten reasons why that was done. The two little, the two little percent reasons. Oh, that that's for the righteousness of you know, you know, they're human beings, and you shouldn't be doing that to human beings. And if you're going to anoint that act as, as you know, God-inspired, which you know that's a that's a better thing to anoint as opposed to you know, you know, making sure you got all your guns in order. Well, then, if that was the case, and people believe that, then why did it take a hundred years for these freed men, women, and children to be given the equality, the civil rights, the equality, something that someone with my Crayola peach and apricot skin pigmentation is born and taken for granted and is so entitled with for the accident of birth of being born in this country. But no, see, that wasn't God-given for these people who are as American as everybody else in America when they're born here, who <laughs> come on, be Let's be realistic, built this country when certain people were a little bit too lazy to go out there in the field or do the construction work. But be that as it may. So you. But other countries would not be so squeamish on what they would do. You hear about that in you know, Australia and New Zealand and in Europe. If there's any a mass any mass gun incident in these countries and they say, fuck it, that's it. We're not going to do that. Whether that's a good or bad thing is immaterial because we are simply not going to do that. So we fold ourselves into our own pretzel over this issue because we have made it into such a right. It's so venerated. As I said before, we used our country used media in order to make people fall in love with the almighty gun and the heroes that wielded those guns in the name of truth justice and the American way and their own versions over the centuries 
Have a Frontiersman, Daniel Boone, David Crockett. And bring it up into the 20th century with John Wayne and all the cowboy shit movies. You know, then, you know, gangster movies or, you know, cop dramas. Hell, in the 1980s, it may as well be the, the year of the gun, the decade of the gun. And that's another thing to point out, too, while we're while on this little side tangent here. When it comes to the good guy with a gun versus the bad guy with a gun, you know, someone was saying that, you know, that's the one, that's the, that's the one guarantee to make sure that that, that ends the bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Yeah. First of all, in majority, vast majority of these gun incidents, there wasn't a good guy with a gun there. So are we supposed to lead ourselves to the point that everybody should be armed at all times? That should always be someone there. I mean, those good people who do end an incident, they are heroes. Flat out. No question. Whether it's the woman saving her husband from two home invaders with an AR-15, or it's a woman that takes out an assailant with who was wielding an AR-15 with her own little handgun, because really that doesn't matter. It's neutralizing the event. But there's far less of that than there's then far more bad guys with guns. So I don't know where your answer is to that other than just making sure everybody has a gun. But if the idea of that is actually stemming from our media, meaning our television shows and our movies, especially movies based out of the 80s, you got to remind you that those good guys with guns the Dirty Harrys John McClane those are cops the majority of those people who are good guys with guns in these action packed thriller movies that you are you know living vicariously through are people who would have guns so Unless you're going to join the police department or join the military. That's TV. That's movies. This is real life. We go into the same circular argument as to what are we supposed to do about this. And I said other countries would really just yank away, which was not, would never fly in this country. Because there is a gun culture that is uniquely United States, as I said, and that is fed by the gun lobby from NRA, various other groups. It would feed into that. Sorry for the pregnant pause and thinking. I'm thinking because it's nearly 3 a.m. But I said in the last video is that anything, anything that's brought up, any a mild suggestion of anything involving some gun control, gun restrictions, you know, maybe just maybe not be able to 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 buy every fucking military ordinance capable that just is slapped away and to see how infuriating it is is when you look up after Rob Elementary and look up how the con country is dealing with this you know outside of the thoughts and prayers people are going out unfazed 
this is why when I first started the other video, the last video, it says, you know, when the question is asked, is this enough? And my answer, the, which is the re reality answer here, whether you like it or not, is that they're not counting. These people, these, these politicians, especially, who will blame it on doors. That there was a, there's too many doors in a school. Or they're going to blame it on rap music. Or they're going to blame it on metal music. Or they're going to blame it on video games. Uh, it, people are blaming it on our own education system. Blaming it, you know, just, you know, the lack of Christ in school. Which is very funny because churches also get shot up. So that makes sense. I can understand the thinking in that, but you also have to have the component of the availability of guns. I mean, I would love to have an accurate census of how many people are in this country and tack that on with how many guns are floating around in this country. It is lunacy. And as I said in the last thing, and I'm, I keep doing callbacks in my other video because I think I said a lot of clever things and not all that often. But it is a Pandora's box that was opened long time ago that can never be closed. But I found it interesting. There's, but there's always these little interesting things that you find out. Like the shooter in uh, Vivaldi Ramos did you know and let's we'll, we'll verify it but did you know that it was rumored that he tried to get the guns he was going to use initially illegally but he couldn't do it so he had to wait till he could get it legally it turns out for at least for him if it's true it was easier for him to get guns legally than it was illegally now that should give you a little bit of pause especially where we're at in our state of being when it becomes things like guns and how protective we are to make sure the person that is able to purchase a gun is of right is insane mind does not have evil thoughts going through his head that he passes everything with flying colors because I will say it again is that gun owners responsible gun owners should be the ones who should be screaming off the top of their lungs for gun restrictions and regulations because they can pass it. And they would have the largest voice that would be credible for that argument. But for whatever reason, we hear, we don't hear any of that from them. Or at least not few. They'll be, like, like in the panel, again, thoughtful people who, who agreed that background checks should be more stringent. However, the person also says there shouldn't be any gun regulation at all. And I shouldn't register my guns because that might lead to confidence. They'll not leave it to be the government takes it away. Hmm. And no matter what type of gun, by the way, you know, caliber bullet, you know, what whatever it is, as long as, long as it's semi-auto. But beyond that, you know, you don't want to register anything with the government. You know, fine. Um, I don't know if there's a motivation in that simply because, you know, you think you're one day you're going to fight the government and you think the only thing is protecting you from the government coming into your house is your stockpile. Hate to break it to you. The government has drones. The government has satellites. 
in orbit. That could be infrared. That could see you in your house right now. Government has more access to more military grade weaponry because they are the military. If they were wanting to come in, they would come in, regardless of what you have. But I don't know, maybe it's the thought that counts. One moment. Time in. I was trying to follow up on uh, what I just said about uh, Ramos and the illegal gun thing. The thing is, is that he tried through his sister to get her his sister who was a who was in from the navy to purchase guns for him and she declined to do so so that's the that's the way that went for him trying to purchase some illegal guns and uh but the point still is solid because it was still easier for him to get legal ones once he purchased purchased them when he was 18 but why is it that easy what what is part of this background check where you do not look back and check? Because this is a someone who was di increasingly disturbed as family and friends and people are discovering now about him being. How was he able to get guns? Once he turned eighteen. How was the guy in Tulsa? able to get guns in order for him hours later to go to the clinic and shoot the doctor that that helped him with his surgery that he still feels pain for and the various other people how is that possible whatever happened I guess the seven day waiting period is, is just a selective thing is background checks not uniform? Like, there's not a uniform thing for it? I had had a conversation with somebody in the chats about that, and then I kind of had the idea that maybe a case-by-case -case basis or a state-by-state -state basis, there should be some differences when it comes to doing these type of checks. And I kind of got the point of that. I kind of can see it because there's a difference between living in a rural area far away from major cities, just little towns here and there, where the cops don't get to you as faster than, say, you know, in these more tightly packed major cities or major counties. I mean, I've seen at my store, whenever we had, we had to call police or we had to call emergency, they were there in five minutes. And six cars or six... Or a couple, couple of cop cars, a couple of ambulances, a fire truck. You know, I mean... So I can kind of see that there would be differences in different situations, but... But why not the wait? I remember on the panel, they brought up a hypothetical about a woman who was, was trying to get a gun, or wanted to get a gun because of her boyfriend or husband was being abusive and was continuously being abusive. And the what if is, you know, would you have her wait the seven days to get that gun? Or would you want her to get it immediately due to the circumstances of her situation? And yeah, that is a tough question. And that is a good question. Now, the woman who was on the pro registration side, she had a good answer towards it because situations like that occurs is that it's not, you know, in your mind's eye you might be able to pull your pull your gun on your, even your abuser, but that's just, that doesn't mean the outcome is going to be going your way. Majority of the majority of that it might not go your way. And if it was a question, if I was able to be on there and the question was posed to me, I would say, yeah, have her do the seven waiting period, seven day waiting period, but do it not at home. Go to a friend's house. Go to a shelter. Go to the police. Wait it out in a safe location or, or safe enough location that you're amongst people. Then wait it out. Then get your gun. Then get, then get regularly trained with it 
so that if this evil dipshit comes back and tries to pull pull this on you, then you can you know step back in a good good distance so you so the gun doesn't take that be taken out of your hands, and then you can brandish it. And, you know, as the scenario goes, it's not all that... Unless you really are a sociopath or a psychopath, it's really not that easy to, to uh, you know, swing your arm out with a gun in hand and ready to fire. I mean, when you think about it, what people go through in the military for their training especially in wartime, what you have to do in order to get yourself over the hurdle of the mental and emotional thing it is to swing your weapon up and pull the trigger. First it can teach you that it's a self-defense thing because they're shooting at you. But then you have to dehumanize. You have to not, you have to, they have to drill into your head not to think about the other person having a family that they won't be able to go home to. That you're trying to tell them, tell these soldiers that they want you to die. They don't want you to go back to your family for whatever the circumstances of this war is, right? And we see this in pretty much every war. You have to dehumanize the other side to, to screw on the courage to do what needs to be done in these situations, right? When I was thinking about it, between the two videos, this one and the last one, I had the um, had the idea of like what they could do to continue the background check, like to to strengthen it here. In this, especially in this day and age, go through their social media because you can you can tell that Salvador Ramos in Texas in the Buffalo shooter they were not quiet in what they were wanting to do. That all was pretty much telegraphed. But, but even if we, that's the case, that in order to uh, facilitate going through the process of the background checks is that they need to know your email so they can research your social medias, see your postings, see what you like, see what you like on these social medias, see what you comment on these social medias, see if there's any provocative that you are saying and which would make determined to your thought process because you might not tell your friends or family everything you might not if you're in therapy you're probably not going to tell your therapist everything but social media a little bit more looser So you might telegraph what you think or what you're going to do. But then comes the argument on the other side of that is, that, oh, well, you might be, that's violating our civil liberties. I mean, that's our private conversations. Not really private, public, public conversations, but be that as it may. There could be an argument to be made that doing that is going too far. But I don't know if that's going too far. In this day and age, I think that can be a valid avenue for researching someone to make sure that they are that they are suitable to own a gun. If they made threats, or if they said anything in or out of context, because and that you know that could be detrimental for anybody. Even if, and that could be one of those things where it's, it is a, it can be a negative idea because I know, 
<laughs> I know for myself, given the various things I've said over times, that if I ever felt the need that I wanted to go and purchase a gun, and that was part of the criteria of background check is to check out my social media, oh, I can, I can tell from recent events where apparently the algorithms do not understand the concept of sarcasm that some things that I have said in my past that is on social media can be taken out of context and so therefore that would be like oh well sorry no Glock for you which is fine I could throw a javelin that's fine I'm kidding kidding context kidding mm -hmm. anyway But once again, this situation, in terms of uh, mass shootings, the solution of this for this thing is beyond our reach. Because there is an unwillingness to go to do anything that, that is suitable or significant. Let's put it like this. Because I mentioned other countries over and over again. If we stopped, we did a moratorium for gun purchases. If that was stopped, then all you have is for the avenues of those who would use guns, would you use for purchasing them if they didn't own them already, illegally. So then you could crack down on illegal gun sales even further because there's no other resource. Or you can amend the idea of a moratorium on gun purchases by going, don't you want a gun so bad? Fine. Enroll yourself in law enforcement. Commit yourself to at least a year in military training. And then you'll be allowed to purchase a gun, still with background checks and restrictions applying, but you would be eligible to do so. How many people would want to do that? many people would not want to do that and again this would be the sort of things as military vets law enforcement agents responsible gun owners should not have a problem with this and again responsible gun owners should not be penalized at all in any of this because this is one of the things is that when people argue with me about it and I obviously being a someone who wants gun restrictions and gun regulations is that they don't get the fact that I am not in favor of buybacks or gun grabs. I don't think responsible gun owners should ever be penalized for this. This is why I urge them to speak up with more of a voice for this because I logically believe that they could pass background checks because they're responsible gun owners. They could take them out. They take them out on the range for target practice. They take them out hunting. They take them out in those cases where they need to defend themselves or their families. And I'm talking about these people who are not, you know, walking into Walmart. With my favorite analogy these days, with a Scud missile launcher strapped to their back. But they can pass it. And even let them wave the wave the whole law enforcement and military thing. Because they can pass it. They're already grandfathered in. But in the wake of the shooting at Robb Elementary, as I said for those six events, the gunfight gunfire events that happened, there were also arrests happening where, where other students of different schools were coming in to their schools with a gun or guns. 
This is becoming a horrific fad. There are people thinking this is cool. That has to get crushed. And I don't know how we're going to do it. Because there's too much politics involved in this. So anything that is common sense goes out the window because you're going after our rats. I don't have much... I don't have much beyond uh, what I'm saying now, and this is it, it is admittedly more rambling and ranting than than anything coherent. So uh, my apologies if this is, this is just going on like that. But it is it is just the dread that knowing. Just knowing that there will be another incident like this. Again, half a dozen just happened half, half since Rob. Not not to the, the, the extent of it being profound. But the horror is that this is becoming more and more normal in our lives. And the unwillingness to come up with anything is astonishing and sad. I'm just thinking, just the moment, sorry. And the weird part is that in the back of my mind, outside of the Tulsa shooter who got his guns and immediately went out to fight, went out to shoot, and the kid who just couldn't wait for his 18th birthday to pick up some guns, some of these people who get their guns to do these shootings. How do they pass the background checks, do you think? How stringent was that? What can we do? I gave an offer of, for this day and age, the social media. I mean, should, should people who are doing the background checks have investigators to ask questions of friends and family? Because that's another good thing. That could be an interesting idea. I mean, how is it that, you know, after the fact, everyone goes to the papers and says that the guy or girl was very troubled. They said some troubling things. We can have screenshots of posts of them on social media about what they're going to do. But the, but the people running the background checks, they don't give a shit. Or if they do give a shit, they, they just don't have the apparatus or anything, any, the support needed to to go in these kinds of investigations? Could an avenue of a solution, a facet of it, be in the overhaul of gun registration? So that these sort of things can be funded to be part of this investigation to make sure in seven days we find out everything you need to know about this person purchasing a gun including motivation what they may or may not tell you of. And if somebody fails to pass a background check, should that person's name be registered to the police, to the local police, if there's a suspicion that they're going to use it, use a gun that they would purchase for direct and intended violence on another person or school or anything, right? Would they be then watched to see if they go around the corner 
and then pick up something from somebody's trunk. See, that's the thing, is that are we at that point, as I said before about uh, the social media, are we at the point where we step on that little gray zone between respecting somebody's rights and their civil liberties and then taking that step beyond for the sake of security? Because the emotional argument of that is that how many dead children does it take? How many dead people does it take? How many wounded people does it take? How many injured does it take? When you, when you think of the horror of how this is becoming a normal thing in our culture, from across the country, someone gets it in their head to, to pick up some guns, to write their little manifestos out, and then go out and do what they're going to do. You do have to look into the mindsets of some of these people, like the Buffalo shooter who, who had a live chat streaming of 15 people were watching him do it. You're handing the prosecution evidence. What did he think was going to happen other than him murdering people? Was he hoping that he would get, you know, hoping for that suicide by cop or he would get killed and no one ever has to ask him questions again? I mean, yeah, he had a thought process going into there. He had a manifesto. He had people watching, so I guess he wants his day in court where he will be found guilty. And he will go away. Will that be worth it? And then when people don't want to talk about the guns or the availability of guns, the accessibility of guns, they want to talk about what brings somebody to the point where they need to pick up a weapon. What can we do to stop that? To stop them to get before they get to that point? One of my suggestions, and these are suggestions that a lot of people have, is tamping down the political fucking rhetoric on both sides. Stop demonizing somebody because they have a difference of opinion. We don't need to agree with each other. That is not a requirement for our country. If it was, then it would be fascism. What is right for you is right for you. It could be right for me, or it could not be right for me, but that doesn't matter because I am not you and you are not me. We are not living each other's lives. But there are people out there, Republicans and Democrats, to the bloated carcass that is Donald Trump, who will fan the flames of conspiracy theories to piss people off so people can cheer him when he does ridiculous bullshit and do violence in his name. I recounted those over and over and over again, so I'm not going to do that shit. But in the same token, the flipping of a coin, only when people demonize and belittle the people that follow that rhetoric, that makes that worse too, because you're just making them the other than the enemy. So then all the people who are supporting the Democrats will look on the other side and we'll make sure there is that gulf between the two sides. So there can be no common ground. There be no moderate. It's one or the other. And that can also lead to, depending on this, your, you know, your local society, that can lead to alienation. That can lead to isolation. You know, all these people say I'm wrong or this or that and belittling and demonizing me, so you know, I'll show them. 
And when it comes down to it, be it politics or bullying or striking at each other's differences, going after somebody's weight or their gender identity or their sexual orientation or the color of their skin or any of that, when it comes down to it, perhaps the simplest explanation for any of this ever happening is a term of, I'll show them. What if that's all there is? When, at the end of the day, what is it? Every shooter, I'll show them. If you do not want to be them in whatever context, maybe be a little kinder to each other be a little bit more respectful to each other again we don't have to agree with each other that's not required we can be acquaintances we can be friends or more and in any of these situations we don't have to agree on anything But there are people out there who do not want us to agree. And an unfortunate byproduct is that when people set out the tinder boxes, they set out the pitch, they drip it all in oil, and they light a match. All for the sake of pissing people off so they can support them against the other because the other's bad and I'm the only one to save you so says the politician they like the match boom someone gets into their head that they become the soldier of whatever ideology whatever rhetoric that made them a soldier for the cause of someone else's gain. How do you break that cycle? Is it mental illness? Is it something that we can get involved and study for that? Because that's the other thing that they will say that, you know, it's mental illness, there's something wrong with these people. But it always seems to be people who are like this. That, that you say, oh, there's something wrong with them, that it's mental illness. Because if it's anything darker than this, then that person is just a thug. That person is just an illegal. That person is just a terrorist. You don't worry about their mental illnesses in those situations, do you? Are there mental illnesses that could be involved in this? Absolutely. They can also be just evil. That is, that is not beyond the realm of possibility, is it? Or, again, being just scapegoat or inflamed by rhetoric to go out and do something to prove themselves to to some demagogue that's that's telling them well all your law all your all the things that happen in your life that's their fault they're being what liberals or gays or trans folk or blacks or Hispanics it doesn't even matter if, if you know they are 100% American born or illegals or migrants as long as they are the other if it's education that's teaching you to respect the other They want us to hate each other, and some of us do take it 
to the point of picking up a weapon and killing. They don't care. Thoughts and prayers. That's it. Move on to the next mass shooting. Oh, and for the NRA, every mass shooting, more money, more money, bring in, buy those guns, buy those guns, protect your family. They clink champagne glasses 19 times for every child at Rob Elementary. Maybe you should go out and give them the, the revenue to clink another one. Just a thought. Rant or rinse, because yours to rant is rising. And unfortunately, I will see you again.